Hello, I'm Jerry Paquette, co-author with Gloria Askew of the book Eat to Save Your Life and the website eattosaveyourlife.com. Our interest in nutrition, health, and medical practice have led us to the work of Dr. Eleanor Stein, a highly respected Canadian psychiatrist practicing in Calgary, Alberta. I have contacted her via Skype, and although the production quality isn't mm, great, it has enabled us to talk together and share her work with all of you. So, thank you, Skype. Dr. Stein is a pioneer in the work to assist people suffering from the disabling diseases MECFS, FM, and MCS. I had expected Dr. Stein to present a rather dark profile of where medical practice stands on MECFS and FM especially, so I was pleasantly surprised to hear so much positive news from her. May the 12th, 2013 is a special awareness day for these diseases, so please join me as I chat with Dr. Stein about MECFS and FM. She begins with an explanation of what's happening on May the 12th, 2013. Well, May 12th is the International Awareness Day for myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and multiple chemical sensitivity. I believe this is the 21st year that we've had this International Awareness Day. So there's groups all over the world um, putting on events, but also using this day or this week to lobby governments. Wonderful. Well, let's, we know we've got a lot of people watching who may be suffering from these diseases. Some people may be new to it. Um, can we define the terms, the, the diseases, particularly um, ME, which not all Canadians might be aware of? Um, so I use the term MECFS to stand for myalgic encephalomyelitis slash mm -hmm. chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. That's the terminology that was adopted in the 2003 a uh, Canadian document which is a consensus guidelines on the diagnosis and management mm -hmm. of the disorder which I'm going to call MECFS. Um, that document is freely available online at www.mefmaction.com. Okay. Uh, there's a document for MECFS and guidelines for treatment and uh, diagnosis and management and there's also one for fibromyalgia. Okay, let's talk about these, um, these guidelines and um, whether or not medical practitioners know about them or, or use them. Um, I think there's a little bit of a difference between MECFS and FM. So in the case of MECFS, uh, the guidelines have had pretty good uptake mm -hmm. around the world. Um, they've been endorsed by the International Association of CFS slash ME. So that's the international scientific community that uh, holds a biannual conference and supports research into this illness. They've also developed a pediatric definition that are based on the Canadian consensus guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, in FM, the fibromyalgia, the story is a little bit different. Because fibromyalgia has a medical home, that is rheumatology, the rheumatologists have been very reluctant to accept guidelines that haven't been created by them. So uptake for the, the FM document has been very low. Dr. Stein, I still am not 100% clear on the distinction between chronic fatigue, which a lot of people talk about, um, and chronic fatigue syndrome. Can you just give me a, a, a lay perspective on the difference between those two? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really, really important question because people use those terms very, I'll say, sloppily. Mm -hmm. um, chronic fatigue is a symptom which many, 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 up to 30% of the population experiences chronic fatigue, meaning they're tired mm -hmm. and it goes on for, you know, more than a couple of days. That's what chronic fatigue means. It could be for so many reasons, like you're just not getting enough sleep, you're working too hard, your kids are sick. You know, there's a, a lousy whole, diet. You have a lousy diet, exactly, that could make you just feel kind of tired. Mm -hmm. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a medical condition for which you have to meet certain criteria. Mm -hmm. The mandatory criteria in the Canadian definition of, of MECFS is post exertional malaise. Mm -hmm. So that means if you exert yourself either um, by exercising physically, 
exercising cognitively, meaning you're working on paperwork, you're trying to get your CPP application in and it's taking you hours, you can crash just as hard as you did with physical exercise or you're exercising emotionally. Maybe you're going through something difficult emotionally in your life. Post-exertional malaise means that after any type of exertion, all of your symptoms get worse. So not just that you feel more tired, but that your sleep gets wrecked, mm -hmm. uh, your appetite might change, your muscles might hurt more, your brain fog might get worse, your dizziness might worsen. Um, so that's really the key of CFS that separates it from chronic fatigue. CFS, you have to have post-exertional malaise, mm -hmm. you have to have sleep disorder, you have to have pain, you have to have problems with your autonomic nervous system, you have to have cognitive issues, you have to have immune issues. So you have to meet all of those criteria. Okay. It's, it's much, much more than fatigue. And interestingly enough, for many people, they say fatigue isn't actually their worst problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's some of those others for many people that disables them even more than fatigue. Yeah, I think the, um, the, our failure to really understand the difference between them is one of the things that isolates people um, because people just dismiss them who isn't tired. Exactly. You know, a big deal. We hear that all the time. Yeah. 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 Okay, can you can you tell me why rheumatology houses FM? Hmm. That's a great question. I think because the, the number one symptom of FM is muscle pain mm -hmm. uh, and rheumatologists deal with bones, joints and muscles. Uh, it somehow kind of got into rheumatology. I have to say though that the rheumatologists aren't very happy to have it yeah. and they're, they're trying to dump it at the moment. There are new Canadian guidelines for the management of fibromyalgia. I don't have the, the web uh, address for that memorized. Mm -hmm. The Canadian Rheumatological Association has accepted those guidelines, so they're hanging in for the moment. Okay. Well, let's talk about um, the um, up-and-coming event on May the 12th for a minute sure. and get an overview. I think you have some things you want to share about that. So I'm organizing an event in Calgary. We have three awesome speakers. Mm -hmm. um, Cindy Bateman is going to talk about the University of Utah research and how she uses that research to inform her clinical practice in Salt Lake City, mm. Utah. So she's a very experienced clinician. Um, Andy Kogelnik is a internist in California mm -hmm. and he's going to talk about his new venture, the Open Medicine Institute, which is a very exciting international research collaborative. And he's also going to talk about his own uh, treatment, which is using antivirals to treat viral infections in people with ME-CFS. Oh, okay. I, gotcha. I know you're very concerned about getting the kind of support that patients need um, and so, many patients don't know the kind of support that's available to them or what would be recommended because doctors are not always fluent in discussing these matters and neither are spouses of people um, who have this disease or family or employers. So what kind of support do you think um, these people need and as a follow-up is it available and if not how do we make it available? Hmm. I think right now the support really is not available uh, for most people with either ME-CFS or FM and I, I base that statement on the data from the Canadian Community Health Survey mm -hmm. that was a survey undertaken by Statistics Canada in 2010 the results of the survey, um, the statistical results, were published in the Quest newsletter, uh, which is published by the National MEFM Action Network in Canada. So again, going to their website, you can access those results. And they sent questionnaires to thousands of people across Canada mm. and asked that people with chronic diseases to respond. And of all the chronic diseases, including things like um, stomach disorders, lung disorders, bowel disorders, stri uh, stroke, cancer, Alzheimer's, heart disease, so all the common uh, chronic disorders, people with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome mm -hmm. had the most unmet health care needs of any chronic diseases in Canada. Mm -hmm. And it's at, it's at about 30% for those two groups. So that means 30% are identifying they're just not getting their needs met. 
How, how do doctors diagnose a person for the disease? It's such a, a potpourri of, of symptoms, it seems. Well, I endorse the Canadian guidelines, the ones I mentioned that were published in 2003, which are widely used around the world uh, for clinical purposes, and there's a checklist. Um, so if you go to that website, the National MEFM Action Network, and you pull up the overview on MECFS or the overview for FM, there's a checklist in that document and you can take that to your physician. Um, if your physician is saying he or she isn't that familiar or comfortable with the diagnoses, and it's actually pretty simple. So if you have certain symptoms, a physician or healthcare practitioner can make the diagnosis. It's not as complicated as some people think. Oh. We, actually, we actually know quite a bit. Um. Uh, are, are doctors becoming more open to discussion with the patient about these, these ailments? I think that varies. So I live in Calgary, as you know, and uh, for the last, say, five or six years, I've been doing continuing medical education for physicians and other healthcare practitioners. And I definitely see uptake in my community. So I'm now getting very good referrals from physicians where they've clearly read the criteria and they've considered whether that patient meets them or not. Um, they've made the diagnosis and then they're referring to me for kind of, you know, secondary or tertiary level care for complicated patients. So I think I can conclude from that that if the information was made available to clinicians, um, from a source that they trust, mm -hmm. and there is pretty good uptake, and and they are learning. So I feel like in my community, the physicians are pretty open, and they're they're doing actually not too bad of a job. I know when I talk to colleagues in other communities where there hasn't been that education, that the situation is quite different. Now that seems to me to be um, an improvement over even the last five or six years. Well, like I say, I think it's in pockets, it's in and pockets. I'm, I'm going to give myself some credit. I think it's because of the work I've been doing here in Calgary, and I have to give the University of Calgary credit because they've invited me, you know, many times to present to different groups of clinicians, so they've enabled me to get that information out. Is there a cure in the making? Do we see any light in that? Hmm, that's a big question, Jerry. Mm. Um, I would say right now there's not a cure. It is quite a complicated disease, so although diagnosing it is not that complicated because we do have criteria which have been validated, so we know that they're pretty accurate, um, treatment is more complicated because people can come to that diagnosis from many pathways. So people can develop MECFS and FM, for example, after surgery, after trauma, after environmental exposure, mm -hmm. um, after infection, after prolonged sleep deprivation, for example, if you have young kids that are unwell, for example. So those people may not all respond to the same treatment. So I think the key, um, Leonard Jason has written about this extensively and it's, I think, fairly widely accepted. The key is to uh, split those conditions into subgroups of more homogeneous or similar types of people and I think treatments are going to be coming online for subgroups but possibly not for all. What, what's the demography here for these diseases? Um, what ages and um, genders and so on? Well, it just so happens from that uh, Canadian Statistics Canada survey I can tell you exactly. So this is 2010 there were 439,000 people in Canada who had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia and there were 411,000 people in Canada who had been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm. And the sex or gender difference, 80% um, of people with fibromyalgia were women in that survey and 66% of uh, people with CFSFM uh, sorry, MECFS were uh, women. So there's a definite female pre preponderance in both conditions. Well, do we know, um, I keep running into a few men here and there who yeah. uh, have been diagnosed and others who, um, from my total lay position, seem to have something um, that looks like these diseases. Mm -hmm. But they tend not to go to the doctors. Men tend to tough it out and not report. Um, do you think that's having an effect on the, on the data and should men 
be going to their doctor with these checklists? I Yes. I mean, it clearly occurs in men and women. Uh, children, the, the, pre the predominance is around middle age in the kind of mid to late 40s. Mm. If, if you kind of do a bell curve on all the statistics, it's in the mid to late 40s. Um, but it can be in children, adolescents, young, middle-aged and elderly, and it can be in men and women. It's it found in all countries around the world. We, you know, that research has been done. Um, in the, I think it was in the 80s, there was kind of this myth out there that it was the yuppie flu, so it was somehow only found in privileged individuals. And that's really been absolutely disproven. Um, like all other medical conditions, it's actually more common in, in poor people.